Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. This is Bridge City News. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. Dancers across the city have joined forces to try and help save a dance company hit hard by the COVID-19 pandemic. The province announced today, in an effort to help Albertans during the pandemic, physician assistants will now be able to diagnose and treat illnesses. And two legendary pandas are leaving Canada and heading back home to China. We will explain why. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. So many local businesses have been hit very hard by the COVID-19 pandemic. Many have closed their doors for good. The amount of dance company in Lethbridge has been hit especially hard by the pandemic. The studio recently announced that they may have to shut down their doors next year. As video journalist Micah Quinn explains, the dancers join forces in a big way to support the studio by raising close to $10,000 through a GoFundMe campaign. Lisan Tahami describes the name for her dance company, Amina, as when you have something special, give it to someone knowing they'll take even better care on return. This is what her dance studio means to her, and when she had to tell her students that she might have to shut down the studio next March due to the COVID-19 pandemic, it created a somber mood. But then her students jumped into action. Everybody was kind of quiet in class, and I was like, okay, I think they're prepared for this. And then I woke up the next morning and it was like a GoFundMe was going on. They were like, let's get on your social media. They had all these plans. And I was like, whoa, when did this happen? <laughs> I mean, I've been thinking about what to do since March and they overnight had a game plan. It was uh, overwhelmingly amazing. Tanya Pickles joined the Amina Dance Company in 2015 and she made a steadfast friend in Tahami. So she decided to start the GoFundMe to help out Tahami in her time of need. From the very beginning, uh, just feeling like Lisan is, is someone really special and you don't find a lot of people um, that are involved in dance that have the heart that she does and our community and our dance family is because of who she is and what she stands for. Money from the GoFundMe will help out with the operating costs of the dance company. Like the insurance of the space, um, all our cleaning supplies, our Zoom, um, so can like just paying all the daily, daily things of a dance studio. Pickles says that the GoFundMe has a goal of $15,000 and it will stay up until they reach that goal. For Bridge City News, I'm Micah Quinn. Between the global pandemic and businesses continuing to struggle, it can be a challenging time for many of us to find uplifting stories in the community. However, one business, Analog Books, will be hosting its grand opening today. Video journalist Ainsley O'Reilly has the details. We're, I, I mean, we're basically opening what appears to be the worst part of the pandemic. Black Friday, government regulations, and a four-year journey has led analog book owners to finally open their doors. People use words like brave and crazy to stupid, <laughs> but, um, but we are very optimistic. I mean, we're, we're confident that this will pass, this too shall pass. The initial plan was to host a block party in Festival Square, but instead, owners are letting in just three people at a time by appointment for a maximum of 12. We're taking all the precautions. We've cut our quant uh, the capacity down considerably, even below the provincial recommendation. It's disappointing, but it's nice that we're able to actually figure out a way to pivot and open now and get the Christmas season behind us. Small businesses in the province employ 530,000 people and inject over $100 billion into the economy annually. Analog Books already has an abundance of local support. When it's Christmas time, when I need to buy gifts, I do like to support the local businesses. And this is great that this bookstore is opening because that's usually my go-to gift. Response to our Facebook and we've had people email us and we've had people call us and we've had people already order from us even though we're not open. At a time when nobody knows how to plan for the future, the Wars family looks forward to owning not only a bookstore, but hosting a vibrant home for community events. For Bridge City News, I'm Ainsley O'Reilly. There's some good news if you're a property owner in Lethbridge. The Finance Committee of City Council said there will be no property tax increase next year or in 2022. 
With most of the heavy lifting already being done towards savings, the city was able to divert homeowners from a tax increase. Some good news as well for the holidays. With many of the recent reductions and potential savings already announced, city officials said it would not be cutting back on Christmas displays this year. That will include lights at the brewery gardens and all future installations of decorative fountains in storm ponds. Mayor Chris Spearman said the lights were not essential but are good in maintaining community spirit. In an effort to reduce the spread of COVID-19, the City of Lethbridge has now launched online booking for all public skating and public swimming facilities. The city said due to the quick launch, there are a few things that you have to be aware of, which include you must have an account in order to book a spot. If your family has an existing account, you must re-add family members. Every person must be registered for their own spot in the chosen session, and payments are to be made at the arena or pool prior to each assigned session. The Blood Tribe has re-elected Chief Roy Fox. Fox garnered the most votes with 628, or around 23% of ballots cast. Close to 90 people ran for 12 seats on council as well for the First Nation. There were four polling stations available yesterday, including at Exhibition Park in Lethbridge. Blackfoot resident Jared Wolfchild says the community was looking for a leader who will address the ongoing opioid crisis. The opiate crisis, I know that's like a huge thing that everyone is trying to, to um, make sure, like to, for ways to take care of it. Like, figuring out different strategies what works what doesn't work and um the housing shortage there's a lot of houses here that uh people that a lot of like homeless people that will need homes or just get kicked out and lose their houses and uh the endangered languages i know that there's a few communities like in brock it barely there's like like the young people we don't really know our language that well and it's slowly dying out, so we're trying to bring it back together. Alberta Health Services has notified officials at Galbraith Elementary School of a case of COVID-19. AHS has begun contact tracing. The infected person has been instructed to quarantine for 14 days. Personal details were not released as if it was a student or a teacher. Officials say the school schedule will proceed as normal on Monday. The UCP reported that there were 1,227 new COVID-19 cases in Alberta. More than 16,200 new tests were completed. The provincial positivity rate currently sits at 7.6%. There are currently 14,217 active cases. There are 405 people in hospital, including 86 in the ICU. There are also nine new deaths over the past 24 hours. Alberta Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Dean Henshaw, says there are now active outbreaks or alerts in 356 schools. That represents around 15% of all schools in the province. These schools have a combined total of 1,326 active cases. This number includes 193 schools with outbreaks, including 89 currently on the watch list. Starting Monday, all students in grades 7 and above will shift to at-home learning until January 11th. Schools are an essential part of our children's health and well-being, and I know that this will be difficult for many. As for COVID-19 numbers in the South Zone, there are now 634 active cases, including 191 here in Lethbridge. The Edmonton Zone still leads the way with 5,222 active coronavirus cases, and that's followed by the Calgary Zone with 4,122. Banff, Alberta has declared a local state of emergency. The town is just under 14,000 residents, but now has 170 cases of the virus. Southern Alberta's Acadia Municipal District has the highest active cases rate across the province. Smoky Lake County and Pinocchio County also have significant case counts when you take into consideration the size of their population. The Government of Alberta announced that beginning April 1st, physician assistants will be recognized as regulated healthcare professionals. The assistants will adhere to the safety and ethics like any other regulated healthcare professional in the province. Health Minister Tyler Shandro said in a statement today that physician assistants will help the government to continue in its efforts to build a patient-centered health system. The responsibilities of a physician assistant may include conducting patient interviews, histories, physical exams, along with diagnosing and treating illnesses. Not only have many provinces been dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, but also a drug crisis. Here in Lethbridge, we've been dealing with similar issues of addictions and overdose deaths. Julie Kissick with the Streets Alive Mission works with the homeless and many who are addicted to meth and fentanyl on a daily basis. She says when the Lethbridge Overdose Prevention Society set up an unsanctioned tent in our city, outside of the mobile injection site provided by the province, they actually created more harm than good. I think that he should encourage the people to go to the proper OPS site because they've got 
medical staff there, they've got social workers, they've got addiction workers, they've got everything set up there to help the person from point A to point B instead of just getting stuck at point A. So I think they're actually doing a disservice to the addicted population. Catch the full interview with Julie Kissick and myself as we discuss how Streets Alive helps the most vulnerable in our city. That's coming up in the second half of our program. The town of Tabor has announced their winner of the 2020 Economic Developers Alberta Outstanding Young Professional Award. According to the EDA, the award is presented to those who display excellent work in economic development within the province. Yeah, I was really honoured to uh, receive the award last night at the EDA conference. Um, it was a, a real pleasure to be uh, recognized by my peers. I think it speaks volumes to the work we've been doing at the town of Tabor to build some collaborative partnerships in the region. We're working with the city of Lethbridge, Lethbridge County, the municipal district of Tabor, um, the town of Coaldale, and a variety of projects related to investment attraction and really growing the community. We're doing a lot of things locally with the chamber and with our community futures. And so, yeah, so it was just a real honor to be, uh, to be recognized by my peers. The award was presented to Young last night at an online EDA awards banquet. The Calgary Zoo announced that Air Shun and Damao are hopping on the Panda Express. The two giant pandas are heading back to China due to barriers with transporting fresh bamboo, which makes up 99% of their diet. On average, a fully grown panda will eat about 40 kilograms or 88 pounds worth of bamboo each and every day. Travel restrictions as a result of the pandemic caused significant delays in getting necessary permits. Air Sun and Damao arrived in Canada about 10 years ago with an agreement between the two countries. The panda spent the first five years at the Toronto Zoo. A church near Steinbach, Manitoba that was fined for holding a Sunday service despite COVID-19 public health restrictions is vowing to do it all over again. The Church of God restoration was slapped with a $5,000 fine for holding an in-person service last weekend. A spokesperson for the church, Henry Hildebrandt, posted on Facebook encouraging people to attend the upcoming Sunday service. He says the silenced majority is rising up. As part of the lockdown in Manitoba, not even drive-in church services are apparently being allowed. The province says only virtual services and virtual gatherings are being permitted right now during the pandemic. Now that's not sitting well with some of the church community. Heather Williams wrote in a Facebook post earlier today, apparently sitting in your own car, windows up six feet away from other cars is way too unsafe. She's asking those who are against this rule to call Premier Brian Pallister or Infrastructure Minister Blaine Peterson to voice their displeasure. The Pallister government of Manitoba is paving the way for hiring minors to keep alcohol and cannabis out of the hands of underage Manitobans. Details of a bill being introduced would enable the province to hire minor agents to help enforce the law. The legislation provides for the hiring of youth to work with inspectors to catch vendors selling to underage people. Liberal leader Dougal Lamont says the idea is ridiculous and is a big waste of taxpayers' money. New rules aimed at helping Saskatchewan contain its spread of the coronavirus kicked in today. Group sports are suspended and no more than 30 people are allowed to gather inside of public venues. The cap applies to worship services, bingo halls and receptions for weddings and funerals. No more than four people can sit together at a bar or restaurant and tables must be three metres apart if they're not separated by a barrier. Large retail stores have to cut their capacity by half. BC Premier John Horgan appointed his new cabinet in the pandemic battle. Horgan says he kept current health minister Adrian Dix in the same post and appointed former municipal affairs minister Selena Robinson as the new minister of finance to replace Carol James who did not run in the last month election. Horgan says Ravi Kalan will be his point person to lead pandemic recovery efforts. There's a lot of uh, uh, bits and pieces in the ministry. We've added a bunch more uh, through the uh, transition process. Uh, the recovery initiatives that we announced in September will now be overseen by Ravi. We have had a cross-government approach to recovery uh, from the beginning, but uh, Ravi will be the point person, and, and I'm confident that uh, he is going to make sure everything that we can do will be done so that the economic recovery that we need to follow uh, from uh, the second wave and into uh, the uh, therapeutics and other options with respect to vaccines that we hope to see in the early part of the first quarter of next year, uh, Ravi, uh, Minister Dix, uh, working with uh, Minister Robinson and others, will be on the point on that. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says the federal government made sure to sign deals with a variety of potential COVID-19 vaccines producers to ensure Canadians would get one that worked. Trudeau says if everything goes according to plan, most Canadians will have access by September.
I can understand the eagerness uh, with which people want to know when is this going to be over? When are we going to get the vaccines? What we can say is we are working extremely hard to deliver as quickly and as safely as possible. And I know people are really eager to find out when are we going to get to that starting line? When are we going to start uh, giving people vaccines? And we're working as hard as we can to make that as quickly as possible. But at the same time, what really matters is when we get to cross the finish line. Prime Minister Trudeau also says Indigenous groups will receive $542 million in federal funding towards setting up their own welfare services for children and families. Federal figures show more than half of the kids in foster care across the country are Indigenous. Ottawa has been promising to transfer control over child and family services to Indigenous governing bodies so they don't have to rely so heavily on outsiders. U.S. President Donald Trump says he will leave the White House if the Electoral College formalizes President-elect Joe Biden's victory. He did insist, however, that such a decision would be a mistake. It's going to be a very hard thing to concede because we know there was massive fraud. Well, if they do, they made a mistake because this election was a fraud. Just so you understand, this election was a fraud. I mean, they have Biden beating Obama on Obama's vote in areas that mattered in terms of the election, in swing states. And yet he's losing to Obama all over the place. But he's beating Obama in swing states, which are the states that mattered for purposes of the election. So, no, I can't say that at all. I think it's a, it's a possibility. As the COVID-19 pandemic raged in the spring, many North Americans tapped into newfound passions like gardening and baking. Now, the Christmas tree industry is hoping that as 2020 draws to a close, that affinity for feel-good and old-fashioned will bring a boost for business. First cut Christmas trees are in great demand. We've never seen the demand like we have this year. We are the largest provider of fresh cut Christmas trees in the world. Between our operation here at McKenzie Farms and our sister operation in North Carolina, Happy Holiday, we ship between 1.8 and 2 million trees a year. The weekend after Thanksgiving, about 25 to 30 percent of the total sales uh, are during that weekend. And this year, we're going to look at 15 to 20 percent before Thanksgiving, 35 to 45 percent after Thanksgiving. Argentinians gathered to mourn the death of football legend Diego Maradona. The former soccer superstar passed away November 25th at the age of 60. A preliminary autopsy leaked to the media revealed that he died from heart failure. His death triggered mourning by soccer fans around the world. Many in Argentina viewed Maradona as a national hero. His coffin draped in Argentina's national flag and a shirt bearing his number 10 on the back was on public display at the presidential palace. Samaritan's Purse is providing emergency supplies, including food and water, to families in Cambodia who have been severely impacted by a recent tropical storm that produced heavy rain and flash flooding. My name is Anna Zatsipina, and I'm the protection manager here at Samaritan's Purse Cambodia. And today we're here at Kampong Prieng Commune in Battambang province of Cambodia, um, a community that was heavily affected by Nangka tropical storm that came through Cambodia in October. Cambodia was hit with flooding and a lot of these families lost the remainder of their livelihoods. Right after the storm we were able to provide emergency food and water and today we're able to follow that up with non-food relief items such as buckets and soap and water filters because many of the water sources were contaminated by the floods and in addition we're doing cash transfers that are equivalent to a monthly food supply in order to give these families the dignity of choice and also support the local economy. And we would not be able to do any of this without your support. So thank you. Great to see the great work that Samaritan's Purse is doing. Our city had a wind warning earlier today, winds up to 110 kilometers an hour, and that'll continue for the short term, but so will the warmer temperatures. Complete weather details are coming up. Environment Canada issued a wind warning earlier today. Some regions of southwestern Alberta saw gusts well over 100 kilometers an hour. Jeanette Rocher is here now with a full look at the weather forecast. Jeanette, the wind may remain for a while and we could possibly see some moisture tomorrow as well. 
Mm -hmm. Yes, that's true. And let me just say how while we're talking about the wind warning, Lethbridge actually won't see the worst of that. Uh, some areas like Vauxhall, Milk River, Tabor, they could see wind gusts up to 130 K tonight. Lethbridge, however, we'll see wind gusts of about 70 kilometers per hour. Not too bad considering it's Lethbridge. We're kind of used to it. Overnight low tonight, zero into tomorrow, Saturday, uh, four degrees. We're going to wake up with some sunshine. Those clouds will start increasing around noon. We could see a 30% chance of flurries tomorrow afternoon. That's that moisture you were talking about. Eight degrees is the high for Sunday under sunny skies. Mix of sun and cloud for Monday. High of nine, high of two on Tuesday, 12 on Wednesday. And we could see temperatures rising all the way up to 14 on a Thursday. Will be lovely to see those double digits, especially the teens next week. So that's well above our average high for this time of year, which is two average low is minus 10. 12 was the high temperature in 1949. And look at that back in 85. There was a cold snap there. Minus 34 was the lowest temperature. 802 was our sunrise this morning and 4.37 p.m. is when the sun sets on our Friday. So day certainly getting closer as we're getting into December now. So mainly sunny skies over in Victoria after all the rain they've had this week. Nine degrees is the high. Nine in Vancouver as well. Mix of sun and cloud. Could see some wind on the coast there. Uh, chance of flurries in Edmonton tomorrow. High of zero. Mainly sunny skies in Calgary. They could see wind gusts up to 50 K per hour as well with a high of one degrees as we look further east into the rest of the prairies here. Saskatoon's high minus one. Mix of sun and cloud. They could feel a little chillier with the wind chill. Regina could see a chance of flurries as well. Two degrees is the high and five is the high for Winnipeg under sunny skies. They too could see a little bit of wind. Not quite like what we're having out here though. Okay, so Toronto could see a 30% chance of flurries or showers. Ottawa is gonna see a 30% chance of showers in the morning. Uh, risk of freezing and drizzle and then switch to snow in the afternoon. Montreal also same thing, could see a chance of showers. Lots of showers happening on the east coast here as well. Fredericton and Halifax, 60% chance of showers. Chance of showers also in Charlottetown with a high of seven, high of 12 in St. John's, Newfoundland. And they could see five to 10 millimeters of rain. There you go, that is your forecast. The big day has arrived, but Black Friday looks a little bit different this year during the COVID-19 pandemic. Even with rising coronavirus cases, retailers are still banking on today's sales to boost their bottom line. Retail analysts say some bargain hunters are still expected to shop in brick and mortar stores in the hopes of snagging a blockbuster deal, but most shopping will be done online. Big box stores, which attract the largest lineups, have moved their promotions online. The head of retail at Google Canada says e-commerce in our country has doubled during the pandemic. With its airline travel business decimated by the pandemic, Air Canada is looking to other avenues for growth. The carrier's pilots have ratified changes to their contract that will help the company grow its cargo business. The Montreal-based airline says it operates up to 100 international all-cargo flights a week. It says the contract changes will help it competitively operate dedicated cargo aircraft and it is working to convert mainly recently retired airplanes from passenger to all freighter aircraft. Many who advocate for green energy say that thousands of jobs will be created and money will be saved once we further embrace the technology. Now that's not necessarily true according to an economics professor at the University of Guelph. Dr. Ross McKittrick says by relying less on fossil fuels, it may actually cost more money. Representatives of the renewable fuels industry or the wind energy industry coming along and saying, don't worry, there'll be lots of jobs in these new sectors. Typically though, um, for instance, our experience in Ontario going the green energy route, um, they said it wouldn't affect electricity prices, but the reality was our prices more than doubled. And they said that it would create a lot of new jobs. And the reality was that because of the increased electricity prices and the loss of manufacturing that, that went along with that, we lost at least two jobs for every job that was created in the renewable energy sector. Catch the full interview with Professor Ross McKittrick and Jeanette Rocher, who will discuss the clean fuel standard coming up after business news. Now, here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was up 45 points in the day to finish at 17,396. The Dow was up 37 points to 29,910. The S&P 500 was up 8 points to 3638. And the Nasdaq was up 111 points on the day to finish at 12,205. West Texas Intermediate Oil was down 19 cents to 45.52 US per barrel. Natural gas was down 11 cents to 285. 
Gold was down 2801 on the day to 1787.79 US an ounce, and silver was down 85 cents to 2257 US an ounce. Wheat is at $272 per metric ton, barley's at $274, canola went up a bit to 586, and corn is at $293 per metric ton. Live cattle were down 93 cents to 113.25, feeder cattle were down 35 cents to 139.83 and lean hogs were down 30 cents to 65.88. The Canadian dollar was up slightly over the past 24 hours to 76.98 US. Recapping one of our top stories this hour, there's some good news if you're a property owner in Lethbridge. The Finance Committee of City Council said there will be no property tax increase next year or in the year 2022. With most of the heavy lifting already done towards savings, the city was able to divert homeowners from a tax increase. Is green energy the way to go? Should we abandon the oil and gas sector as we move forward with our economy? An economics professor in Guelph, Ontario says no. Here are the thoughts of Dr. Ross McKittrick in an interview with Jeanette Roche coming up shortly. But first, here's a look what's happening in and around your community. Here's your Bridge City News community calendar. Christmas at Casa Holiday Market is going online this year from now until December 1st at christmasatcasa.ca. Avoid the crowds and find one-of-a-kind art pieces and fine crafts handmade by over 40 vendors. Depending on the vendor, there are various options for local drop-off, shipping, and safe curbside pickup. Visit christmasatcasa.ca today. Shop of Wonders is looking for volunteers beginning in December to help bring some Christmas cheer to families who need a special something this year. This is a My City Care initiative through My Victory Church in Lethbridge, which helps to give people hope and a hand up. Volunteers will wrap gifts, entertain kids, and assist with other tasks. To learn more about this opportunity, call Carol at 403-942-1378 or email carol at myvictory.ca. Get to know your city and take part in the Lethbridge Scavenger Hunt. Download the Let's Roam Scavenger Hunt app, lace up your walking shoes, and head out with family to discover the best landmarks in Lethbridge. Put your navigation skills to the test while enjoying the journey at your own pace. No reservations, no tour guides, and fun for all ages. Visit letsroam.com slash scavenger hunt. And that's your Bridge City News community calendar, brought to you by the Movie Mill. For trailers, times, and tickets, visit moviemill.com. The federal government continues its fight against climate change with a number of bills and proposals. Some say this is making for great progress. Others believe it's highly ineffective. Joining me to discuss this is Dr. Ross McKittrick, a professor of economics at the University of Guelph and a senior fellow at the Fraser Institute. Dr. McKittrick, thank you so much for joining me today via Skype from Guelph. My pleasure. Absolutely. Yeah, my pleasure. Absolutely. Now, you wrote an article in the Financial Post on the proposed federal CFS or Clean Fuel Standard. Can you tell us what exactly the Clean Fuel Standard requires from us? Well, the uh, the standard is um, it's not directed at ordinary air pollution. It's it's directed at trying to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide that uh, is released from the fuel being burned. And the only way you can really do that is to blend in various forms of biofuels. So it'll mean blending in more ethanol into gasoline and biogas into natural gas. And um, the hope is that uh, on a life cycle or um, an engineering basis, there's less carbon dioxide emissions from that blended fuel. The effect of this will be um, because these are more expensive fuel streams biogas and, and ethanol are more expensive to produce than regular fuel it will raise the cost of fuels uh, depending on how stringent the target is one estimate from the canadian energy research institute is the price of natural gas could be pushed up by about 60 percent to fully comply with this rule they may not push it that far it's still a bit hard to tell but it'll also add probably five to 10 cents per liter to the price of gasoline. And um, the uh, effect of this, uh, the government hopes uh, they will reduce national uh, carbon dioxide emissions or greenhouse gas emissions by um, about 30 megatons, which would get us partway to the um, Paris climate target, but certainly wouldn't be enough to get us there. 
Right. So although the term biofuel may sound good because it requires fertilizer, water, and land to produce, that process itself can increase pollution. And some say it costs more in energy to produce than you would actually end up saving. Is that right? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, that is right. The um, uh, If you start with, for instance, a crop of corn, to turn it into ethanol is a very energy intensive process. And uh, a lot of it is actually done in the United States where they use electricity from a very fossil fuel intensive electricity grid. So that's why when uh, we look at the actual emission reduction from switching to ethanol, you have to look at it on this life cycle basis. And it's if it's in, in the end, if it's actually the case that you get lower emissions from ethanol, it's not lower by much. It's lower at the tailpipe level, but it's uh, on the life cycle basis. Some estimates are that depending on where you get the ethanol from, we actually would increase total emissions. Okay, so the whole point of the clean fuel standard is to reduce carbon emissions from the use of fossil fuels. But we already have a carbon tax that's being imposed. So why do we also need the CFS forced upon producers and consumers? Yeah, that's a good question. The rationale for the carbon tax is it gives everybody a financial incentive to find the cheapest way possible to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. Um, we, in economics, we like those kinds of policies because then you can say, all right, we're going to agree on how much emission reduction we're going to achieve. This is the way to do it at the lowest possible cost. But that only works if then the government stands back and lets the system work. Uh, if they let the market find those solutions under the incentive of the, the carbon tax. What they're doing here is actually undermining the carbon tax because they're saying to the fuel producers and the fuel users, all right, you still have to pay the carbon tax, but we're also going to add this extra set of rules. Specifically, you have to blend in all these um, biofuels into the liquid and gas stream. And it's happening at a much higher cost than the cost of complying with the carbon tax. So they've really um, unraveled the efficiency aspect of the carbon tax doing it this way, but of course they're still requiring us to pay it. Yeah, <clears throat> this doesn't sound like an economically feasible plan, but will it actually make a difference? Will it reduce carbon emissions significantly, especially as our population continues to grow and demand for fuel continues as well? Um, there's a conflict between the goal of reaching the Paris targets and holding our emissions permanently below the target level and also trying to increase the workforce much more rapidly than we've done in the past. And the government's trying to pursue both goals at once. The reality is that the um, uh, population growth that they have in mind over the next few years will more than offset any other re reductions from the clean fuel standard. It, um, we ran into this problem with the Kyoto Protocol many years ago. A lot of people have, have forgotten all about that, but uh, the government of the day signed a treaty in Kyoto promising to get our emissions down by a fairly ambitious amount and keep them keep them down after 2010. And then it just turned out to be very expensive to do that because the technology isn't available that would let us use fossil fuels the way we do in a in a large cold. Uh, spread out country like we have. Um, we can't use fossil fuels to uh, run our cars and heat our homes and get emissions down by the amount that they promised. So we ended up abandoning the Kyoto commitment. We're going to run into the same problem with Paris, that the government can, they, they can put these policies forward. They're very expensive to try. In the end, they don't actually accomplish what uh, the government hopes that they will. And so we, something's got to give at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Why is net zero so important to the government? Why do we have to get there regardless of costs? Carbon dioxide in and of itself isn't a pollutant. Is it not, in fact, very necessary for a healthy planet? Well, uh, yeah, carbon dioxide has never been regulated in the past because it's not a local air contaminant. We regulate carbon monoxide and particulates and sulfur dioxide and, and other forms of local air pollution but we didn't used to regulate carbon dioxide because as you say, it is a, a natural part of the atmosphere and it's it's essential for plant life. 
What's happening now, though, is with fossil fuel consumption, that does release carbon dioxide emissions. And the concern is that over the long term, that can have an effect on the climate. And so the idea of going to net zero carbon dioxide emissions, which is a far more radical target even than the Paris Accord targets, um, the government seems to have adopted that without much in the way of a discussion with the public about why we need to do that, how much it would cost, and whether there would even be any benefits of, of doing it. And um, even though they pushed the deadline, deadline far out into the future, they are already um, proposing, like the clean fuel standards, some policies that if they go ahead with them, they will be very expensive for people. And I think people deserve a better accounting from the government about why it is that they think this is so important to do and just how much they expect people to pay. Hmm, interesting. Now, green activists argue that clean energy will be an economic boost to Canada, and we shouldn't worry about the fossil fuel industry ending because we can quickly replace it with green energy. So how realistic is that? It's not at all realistic. I've been hearing the same thing now for 20 years or more. Every time the government um, proposes one of these policies, you will have... Um, environmentalists and also sometimes the uh, um, representatives of the renewable fuels industry or the wind energy industry coming along and saying, don't worry, there'll be lots of jobs in these new sectors. Typically though, um, for instance, our experience in Ontario going the green energy route, um, they said it wouldn't affect electricity prices, but the reality was our prices more than doubled. And they said that it would create a lot of new jobs and the reality was that because of the increased electricity prices and the loss of manufacturing that, that went along with that, we lost at least two jobs for every job that was created in the renewable energy sector. And then um, the uh, renewable energy sector jobs are only temporary anyway. Once, once the turbines are built and the solar panels are built, uh, there aren't really ongoing jobs in that sector. So it is not the case that uh, green energy is an economic opportunity. If it was an economic opportunity, you wouldn't need to force people to do it. The market would just pursue the opportunity the way people pursue any other profitable opportunity. The reason we have these policies is precisely because the market realizes these are money losing industries and they don't create jobs. Mm -hmm. Interesting point. Now, you point out also that we all want clean fuel, but apparently for every dollar of environmental benefit from the CFS, we actually lose $6 of income and wealth. Can you explain mm -hmm. that? Yeah, so that comes from tallying up the cost of compliance with the regulation and then also the indirect cost to the rest of the economy from the higher fuel prices and uh, the reduction in the value of investments and things like that. And then, uh, so you have that on one side of the ledger. And then on the other side, we look at well, what are the benefits of reducing the emissions? And um, right now, the, the government sets the carbon tax rate based on scientific estimates of, of what is the benefit of reducing carbon dioxide emissions. And so if we take the maximum value from that schedule and we say, okay, we'll value the emission reductions using the government's own estimate, then it turns out the cost of the policy are six times larger than the benefits. So we can say, yeah, we'll take the government at its word that these emission reductions are valuable, but that's not the end of the story. We are incurring much larger costs to get those emission reductions. And going back to the point of the carbon tax, one of the essential pieces of logic of the carbon tax is it says, we'll pursue emission reductions, but only up to the point where the, the costs of further reductions end up costing more than the benefits. And that's why we initially would go with a carbon tax type policy because then it ensures that you don't get into a situation like we are in with the clean fuel standard where we're getting emission reductions, but the, the costs are far in excess of, of the benefits. Mm -hmm. Now, the federal government also recently tabled new legislation, Bill C-12, that would force current and future federal governments to set binding climate targets to get Canada to net zero carbon by 2050. Any thoughts on what this means for Canadians? Should we be concerned about potential increases in taxes? And what about the impact this might have on things like the cost of gas, groceries, home heating, and anything we purchase? 
Yeah, these are all valid concerns because in order to accomplish the goal, you have to make energy a lot more expensive. There's, there's just no way you can function in a country like Canada without using energy. And uh, if you are going to get people to use less energy, you have to make it more expensive. Now, the legislation, um, it's, it's a, a bit tricky for one government to say they're going to bind all future governments to this plan. Really, all a government can do is bind itself to a plan, but um, they can't pass a law today that every government from now on uh, is bound by because a future government can always repeal the legislation if they want. I think the concern that's, that's raised here, though, is just it signals that the current government is absolutely determined to pursue this path and they are not particularly concerned about how much it's going to cost people and they're not really listening to that side of the story. Mm -hmm. Is anyone thinking about how excessive spending on climate change is impacting other areas where tax dollars would be put to much better use, like maybe healthcare, education, fighting crime, reducing poverty, the list could go on? Um, well, we think about that sort of thing in, in the economics profession. Uh, I don't think it's, it's nearly prominent enough in the discussion. So going back to the green energy example in Ontario, because of these very high electricity prices, the, the government has said they're going to help some of our, our um, manufacturing and industry groups uh, with lower electricity prices by transferring the cost of some of those expensive green energy contracts onto the taxpayer, basically putting it into um, the government budget. And that's going to be three to three and a half billion dollars per year just to get um, the burden off uh, the manufacturing sector for the electricity costs. Now you think about what that means. That's uh, that's a pharmacare program that we're not able to have because the money is going to cover these contracts. That's services for families with disabled children. That's upgrading hospitals in smaller communities. That's a lot of things that aren't going to happen because we are paying for contracts for electricity that we could have got much cheaper. We didn't need to pay that money in the first place. It's, it's wasted money. And with something like the clean fuel standard, um, you're asking people to pay um, maybe 50 or 60% more for the same natural gas that they were getting previously. Uh, and you have to ask for what? And that's, that's money out of household budgets. It's, that's going to mean uh, money out of farm budgets that they have to pass on to consumers in higher food prices. Um, yes, these are all absolutely legitimate questions. And the sad thing, as far as I can see, is that no, the, uh, uh, the government is not particularly interested in these questions. Mm. Thanks so much, Dr. McKittrick, for your insight. Dr. Ross McKittrick, Professor of Economics at the University of Guelph and a senior fellow at the Fraser Institute. Thanks so much for joining me today. My pleasure. Streets Alive Mission has been making a big difference here in our community for over 30 years. The amazing ministry helps many of our homeless in our community, including those with addictions. They feed them, clothe them, and help them get on their feet in a very big way. Joining me to talk about it is the co-founder of Streets Alive Mission, Julie Kissick. Welcome back to Bridge City News, Julie. Well, thank you, Hal. Good to be here. So 30 years, three decades, does it feel like it? Well, my hair says it's been 30 years, but it hasn't felt like 30 years at all for me. It's, I look back at 30 years and it feels like just a short span of time because I love what I do. We, we absolutely love what we do. We feel called to do what we do. And so when you get up every morning and you love doing what you're doing, it does not feel like drudgery. It doesn't feel long. You know, a few years ago, you took me on a tour of Streets Alive Inside and it really touched my heart in a big way. You showed me this mural with a lot of the clients on the mural. You knew the backstory, you know, all about their lives. You remember their names and most of those people had passed away. Mm -hmm. And I remember you had tears in your eyes as well at that, mm. at that moment. Oh, some of those people became very important to us. And, like family, right? And they, they become like family because you do know them so well and, and because you bury their children and you bury their parents and you bury all their aunties and unki, uncles and you hold them when they cry and you celebrate when they're having a good day and, and they're just like our family. Now, during the lockdown, Streets Alive did not close the doors but kept them open to help those who were desperately in need. How was that received in the community? 
I think it was received really well. Uh, we were one of the few places that was open for them to come into, but one of the important things is that we trustee their money, and so nobody wants to separate anybody from the funds that they have, number one, and they still need clean clothes, and they still need a sandwich, and they still need a phone, and they still need to have that connection with people. So what protocols, Julie, did you and Ken put in place at Streets Alive to protect yourselves, your volunteers, and your clients from COVID-19? Well, here's the funny thing. We were told we had to use a lot of hand sanitizer, but they drink it. So wow. <laughs> the first thing we did is... Well, because we... the alcohol content, sure, I guess, in there, right? Sure, sure. And now they come in Mickeys and 40s and stuff like that, so it's like very attractive. But we opened up a hand washing station, we opened a bathroom, took the toilet out and just nobody could have any kind of a service unless they wash their hands. And of course, uh, the staff is masked and we offer masks to all of the clientele that come through the door. So if they want to access our service, they have to wash up their hands and wear a mask. Now, one of the branches of your ministry is the new Segway Women's House. What is your real vision for this home? How much time do you have? <laughs> well, we've got another <laughs> another 10 47 or so. seconds. Yeah. Uh, the vision that I have for this home is to have a place for women who have nowhere else to go. Um, I was volunteering in the jail right up until COVID, and time after time, women would be leaving the our my chapel service crying because they had nowhere to go except back to their old situation. And they come out of detox, they have nowhere to go but back to the old situation or treatment back to the old situation and I wanted to be able to offer them an alternative until they were healthy enough to maybe even face the old situation and so it's imperative when we help people in recovery that they have a home they have to have a roof you can't if you don't have a roof you don't have the opportunity to recover if you don't have a bed if you don't have three squares you have no opportunity to recover so how do you get that message across to a lot of your clients that you have to change your surroundings, you have to change your bad habits, and even some of the people you hang out with, which is very difficult for a lot of people, especially if they've been on the streets with a lot of these other people they call friends, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's a challenge. It's a challenge to help them um, get to that place where they're able to say goodbye because we could force it, uh, but we all know that lo the law kills. Or uh, we could talk to them and through the programming and instruction and perspective change, they get to the place where they kind of go, hey, you're unhealthy and toxic for me, so I'm going to actually choose not to be with you. And when they get to that point, that's a powerful point in their life. And don't you have some staff or volunteers that help out that maybe went through the program that were homeless or addicted at one point in time? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We're up to armpits Success stories, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. And now, like through COVID, we still continue to do our supportive housing. And uh, the men and the women who were in the housing were just so grateful that they had a job to do while uh, we went through that. And they became the, the big supporters of people that were coming to all the services. They were just like, hey, I made it. You can make it. I've done this for six months. You can do it for six days. And it's just been amazing. Now, Streets Alive is a ministry very similar to what we have here at the Miracle Channel. How do you integrate God and Christ's saving grace into the discussion when it comes to helping people off the street? Well, I think that uh, we're fortunate in that people know we are a Christian mission. And so there's a certain expectation that Christianity is going to come out of our mouth. They have an expectation when I sit up beside them and I'm like, hey, can I pray for you? They expect that. And then they always say yes. And my prayer is always that God would touch their heart with his love so that they could have hope to change. Because love changes everything. So Julie, what's needed right now? Uh, besides money? Yeah, well, we can always use money, right? Yeah, we but can I mean, always use clothing? money. Winter's just around the corner. Hoodies. For Streets Alive, hoodies. We always need jeans. No matter how many times we get jeans, they disappear like that. When you think that we might serve 25 to 40 people per day, that's 25 to 40 pairs of pants, shirts, socks, underwear. So we're always out of underwear. Uh, we don't like secondhand underwear. We like fresh, clean uh, underwear. Uh, Walmart has a great deal. Just throw that out there. Uh, we always need hoodies so they can layer up. We always need jeans, usually men's 30 to 34. Socks? Uh, socks all day long because right. they get to change their socks every day. We can't change their shoes every day, but we can change their socks every day. What about gloves and tubes gloves, and scarves? That's coming up. Right? But uh, yeah. yeah, I think last year we went through six or 7,000 pairs of gloves. The government likes to uh, keep tabs on numbers like Stats Canada. 30 years, how many clients do you think you have served? With streets alive a lot <laughs> i i don't know it's just 
a lot. It's been How many a lot. would you average a day? You know, through the programs. Um, through the programs and the trusteeship, about yeah. 150 a day. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Now you're also developing an Aplex home for men. Yeah, excited. What are some of the needs there? Everything. We need everything there. Uh, we do have a fair amount of furniture um, because we we've been collecting furniture uh, with our warehouse, and so uh, we let agencies have their first pick of everything, and then we have enough to probably be able to share a little bit into that eightplex. But we same thing. We don't have dishes, bath towels, tea towels, laundry soap, cushions, Chesterfields, chair, like everything. We need everything, and it's an eightplex in each. Each plex has two bedrooms, so that's 16 bedrooms that we have to furnish. Julie, the supervised consumption site at Archer shut down after the province did its audit, the $1.6 million in funds that one accounted for, so the province shut it down. Now, the province uh, instituted a mobile SES by the soup kitchen in Lethbridge here. Is the province doing enough to help a lot of those who are addicted? Um, no, it's, not called a, it's not called an SCS anymore. It's called an opioid prevention site. Right. And so the SCS allowed all kinds of different drug use, whereas the OPS is intravenous drug use. Okay. So that's probably narrowed the field a little bit. Um, I have an opinion regarding um, intravenous drug use. Um, I pretty much keep it to myself because I've this seen... This is the forum. Come on. I've seen too many dead people. Okay. I've seen too many people die. Um, from putting poison in their veins, but I understand the concept of it. So how do you feel about people like Tim Slaney, used to work at Arches with the Lethbridge Overdose Prevention Society, putting up these pop-up tents at Galt Gardens, uh, down by the Civic Center of the field, I think that, you know, they're I unsanctioned. Think that, I think that he should encourage the people to go to the proper OPS site because they've got medical staff there, they've got social workers, they've got addiction workers, they've got everything set up there to help the person from point A to point B instead of just getting stuck at point A. So I think they're actually doing a disservice to the addicted population. Let's talk about for a moment the importance of providing a safe place for people as they go through recovery. Tell me a bit about that, how important that is. It is so important that it is safe, but also that it is structured. There has to be a purpose while they're living this safe, that safe existence. So we do a lot of psychoeducational stuff. We do a lot of 12-step stuff. We do boundary work. We do all the work um, that is necessary for them to be able to find their own place of safety after they've been safe with us. So that's our goal, is like recovery is real, we've seen it, it works, and we know how to help people get to point B. Julie, do you in Canada Streets of Life see a lot of transient people coming in from other towns or cities, or is it mostly local, people here in southwestern Alberta? Well, we saw, you know, a year or so ago, we saw a fairly significant influx uh, from other centres, and part of it was the SES. Like other centers meaning from Calgary? Yeah, or? oh yeah, we saw lots of different people because we would see they would come in for clothing. We'd be like, where are you from? What's your name? So we saw all these strange people we didn't know come into the building. And uh, we've also seen lately uh, that they've a lot, some of them have transitioned back possibly to old stomping grounds or whatever. So Let's talk about some of the uh, victories that you've seen as well involving your clients. I mean, we mentioned some of them before who went on to become volunteers or work with you here mm -hmm. at Streets Alive, but just some of those tremendous victories. One, uh, one or two of the victories that I think of right away is uh, one lady who came to us um, out of detox, so she'd only been, you know, uh, detoxed for seven days, and we put her in the house, and she stayed with us for two years. So the first year, she worked her way through all of our programming, and the second year, she started at the university taking her social working and addictions degree. And by the time she left, she was already a year into that degree, going strong, stable, able to, to function and do really well. I'm in contact with women who have exited the, the housing and are back working in their jobs. They're, they've got their kids back working with wow. their kids. So I, I hear from a lot of the people um, that have exited the program in a healthy and safe way. We do have some that exit in a not very healthy and safe way, but we do have a significant amount that, that still stay in touch and they've gone on to live the lives that they had hoped they could have. I've chatted with some members of the Lethbridge Police Department here, and uh, they say a big issue right now when it comes to the drugs, it's not so much fentanyl, but it's methamphetamine. Meth. Are you seeing that as well? Well, about 10 years ago, we saw a huge increase in meth. And back then, the people called it meth bridge. 
Like I know it's just been coined within the last year or two, but we heard it 10 years ago, this is meth bridge. We saw people transition from pills and, and alcohol and stuff uh, into meth. And then about three or four years ago, we watched them transition their meth to take it intravenously. So yeah, meth is the key drug in our city. Now do you have, you talked about opioids as well, do you have naloxone kits there too? Of course. You have to have lots of those on hand? Yeah, on hand and with our outreach team. Wow. As a matter of fact, uh, we've just contracted to have a, uh, a, a special counselor come into Streets Alive to help them decompress from uh, overdoses. And uh, it was worse about a month ago, but um, still they have to be able to have somewhere where they can start to talk about um, somebody just coming back to life and taking a swing at them. Wow. <laughs> what kind of training do your volunteers have to go through in order to be able to handle a lot of what they're seeing? I wish I could remember the term, but our operations director, he does a non violent intervention course that he he runs uh, with our staff like every year or every six months however he sees that that needs to happen so that we learn not to engage up close and personal but how to de-escalate situations so but I'll say with meth it's hard I can imagine that's the, they're just so amped up on the speed and and that sometimes they don't even hear your voice Wow so the best time for us to reach out to them is when they're starting to come down off the meth and yeah. So in your opinion, how can we curtail a lot of the drug use in our city and keep the drugs out of our city? You know, we've had a lot of people say, how can we get drugs out of our city? Well, they tried prohibition with the alcohol and we all know how that worked. Everything went underground. Um, and I think that um, the drug use is with us until the end of time because there are always going to be people who are hurt and looking for an anesthetic. And, as and long they're trying as to fill that void. And they're trying Not with to God, that, but with drugs and alcohol. Yeah, they, have, they, they don't know how to go to God. They don't know how to accept his love and let that love work with them because that's a slow process and, they're, and they want the fast process. They want the, the drug that's going to just take a hold of them and make them feel better instantly. So Quick fix. It is, and it's a powerful fix. Wow. So for people to just say, well, just stop using, it is just not that easy. Julie Kissick, co-founder of Streets Alive Mission here in Lethbridge. Thanks so much for your time today. Thank you. On behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, I'm Hal Roberts. God bless and thanks so much for watching. <laughs>